Let me start by first of all uh, expressing my gratitude to Cork University Business School for uh, the invitation to come and, and speak to you this evening and, and thank you very much uh, for coming. Um, what I want to do essentially in this presentation is to, three things really, talk about some of the challenges that we're facing in dealing with the question of respect, um, particularly within a leadership context. Then I want to talk about some newer developments uh, in relation to, particularly in relation to this concept of mutual respect and what that might mean in leadership. Um, and the third thing I want to do is, is really to also try to um, uh, incorporate quite a bit of practical suggestions. So they're the three sort of objectives I'm, I'm going to try to uh, achieve uh, in the presentation. Um, let me start off with, though, um, by asking you with a show of hands, um, how many of you uh, would say that you experienced uh, disrespect during the past week? Any form of disrespect or a lack of respect? Put your hands right up. So just, uh... Okay, so it's about... Okay, and then how many of you would say this now as a safe group? Uh, and it, it, <laughs> It won't go any further. How many would you say that, how many of you would admit to um, perhaps expressing a lack of respect to someone else in the past week? Yeah, the numbers, the numbers are far less, aren't they, when we, when we ask that? Um, well, it's interesting because I think there was about uh, maybe a third who said that they had um, experienced disrespect in the past week. Now, what is interesting is uh, Christine Porath. Uh, from Georgetown University in the United States um, has been working about 20 years uh, looking at the question of incivility and in particular uh, disrespect and one of the conclusions that she has reached um, is that the lack of respect in the workplace seems to be getting worse. So for example in 1998 she's been undertaking various um, workplace surveys of civility and civility in the United States workplace. And in 1998, about 25% of people said that they had experienced um, a lack of respect or disrespect about once a week. By 2005, that had increased to 50%. Um, there's also various other evidence. So, for example, the CIPD survey around conflict at work. Um, that research, 40% of respondents said that they experienced interpersonal conflict and the root of that was a lack of respect. Um, and then of course there's other, if you like, some of the more negative aspects that we might think of disrespect, such as the, uh, the extreme, which is around bullying. And even there, the, the, the evidence seems to suggest from the US Workplace Bullying Institute that the, the level of bullying is quite high. So 20% of people say that they've experienced bullying or themselves, and a further 20% say that they've witnessed other people experience bullying. So on the face of it, there seems to be an issue here, which is perhaps this question of respect getting worse. Now, what is also interesting is why should that matter? So the HBR survey, this is the Harvard Business Review, this was a piece of work that was done, in, in fact, in conjunction um, with Christine Porath. And there were some interesting findings here. The first is that respect, they found, was highly correlated with engagement at work. And for many of you um, who are work perhaps in HR or are managers, you'll realize that engagement is quite an important metric today uh, when looking at organization health and well-being. So respect is very important. Um, those that get respect from their leaders uh, reported about 50% better well-being, 85% uh, greater satisfaction, and 55% more engaged. So at one point we have respect seems to be deteriorating according to a number of surveys. This seems to be pointing out that actually respect is quite important when we look at the workplace. And there's another matter which is that over half of people in this survey, and it was a study of 20,000 employees from across the world, reported 50, over half, 54%, that they don't regularly receive respect from their leaders. So this poses an interesting problem. Respect's getting worse, respect's important from engagement, and 
respect seems to be problematic, particularly in terms of employees suggesting they don't get the type of respect they expect from the people that manage them. The question then is how might we explain this? What is going on? There's been a number of things, of course, you could argue. Globalisation, cultural differences in understanding what respect is. And there are cultural differences. I mean, I, one of the interesting experiences I had in Shanghai, I don't know if everyone's been to China, but if you try to get off the metro in, in Shanghai, you will have a very different experience from another, you know, many other countries. You're met with a wall of people who just trample all over you. And, of course, you know, uh, in some cultures, that would be very much seen as quite disrespectful. So the cultural differences globalisation, could this explain? That's one argument. There's other arguments people look at and say, well, maybe it's a generational thing. There's a, a researcher um, in the States called Gene Twent, Gene Twent, who's looked at uh, the level of narcissism, narcissism among students. And she, her work suggests that the level of narcissism has increased by about 30% over the past 25 years, i.e. students are more narcissistic in that age group, uh, young people. That would, so that might mean if you're more narcissistic, you're more interested in yourself, this potentially might mean you probably have less, you're, you're less switched on to how you might be offending others. This is perhaps an answer. But of course, it's probably a lot more complicated than these things. And one of the things that we do know is there's increasing evidence that workplace relationships are under increasing strain. Um, and there's lots of evidence that tells us that. Uh, increasing conflict at work, uh, more people reporting uh, pressure in terms of uh, uh, the, the amount of work and work overload that they're having to do. Uh, the, right, the, the, the technology causing problems in terms of in fact, people who, who work remotely or outside the workplace, spending less time working with people in, and forming relationships, they often uh, report actually having lay, um, lower levels of uh, disrespect. And of course, many of you will know, you know the use of email and the increasing amount of time we spend on it and various communication technologies, they often also uh, can give rise to uh, problems with um, uh, lack of respect. Um, but the, one of the other things that's come up, um, and especially um, from Christine Porath's work, is that one of the reasons that seems to be an increasing uh, problem with respect is that leaders simply lack awareness, that they are not aware that what they are doing or their behaviours are causing problems. Now, I don't know how that can be quite a difficult thing to think about. I mean, do we believe that? Um, I mean, so the question of, is it plausible that, they are, that they're not aware? And if it is plausible, what do we do about it? Well, the first, really thing, the first thing to think about in approaching that question is, what do we mean by respect? And this is the first thing we need to, to approach. So we need to gain a better understanding of what respect means and its effects. Now, I'm going to show you a clip. It's only three minutes. The interesting thing about that clip is that it, it's a good example of different types of behaviours that seem to be associated with different ways we might understand the concept of respect. What is respect? They appear to be, certainly in the literature, two concepts of what respect is. Respect is a multi-dimensional idea. The first is a judgment of worthiness based upon some perceived quality possessed by an individual. A judgment of worthiness, such as status. So in that clip, when Erin Brockovich is told you haven't showed respect, to some extent what he was talking about was that you haven't shown respect in terms of respect for her position respect for the competence she has in her role. Um, so there's this question of appraisal respect. This is like the, when we talk about you have to earn respect. It's based upon a judgment that we make as individuals that we wish to send respect because we see something and a characteristic um, of someone as being particularly notable, status, being worthy. There's also another form of respect 
which is to act in an unbiased, dignified, ethical and trust trustworthy manner, recognition of respect. So this is the idea that, that I'm due respect because of my humanity. I'm due respect uh, and, and respectful treatment in terms of regard. Um, it's the, I'm due uh, I, uh, by virtue of being me, of virtue of being human. Not because I have particular qualities that are valuable or worthy, but purely, purely based on the fact of being human. So two very different ideas about what respect can mean. Now, it becomes important for us to distinguish these two forms of respect. I've got a bit of a diagram there, and I hope that doesn't put you off, but the important thing to notice is that these two forms of respect communicate particular, are associated with particular behaviours that <coughs> um, help an individual satisfy particular needs two types of psychological needs that we all have. A need for belonging, a need to, for inclusiveness, and a need for status. A need for status is, refers to the need to uh, be valued uh, by others. Um, these two needs are very much important for us in terms of forming a healthy social identity. We need to be included uh, as part of uh, being human. Uh, we also have a need to be valued as part of being human. Now, the important thing is both of those needs, when those needs are satisfied, when people show these two forms of respect, they lead to two different types of outcomes. The first is they're associated with self-esteem. That's why when people uh, don't experience disrespect, when they experience disrespect, often the immediate response is an attack on their identity and they have an attack on their self-esteem. The other thing, the, out the other um, outcome from receiving these different forms of respect is that individuals often will have higher levels of identification with the individual who's respecting them, who's showing them uh, respect. And that will lead, that identification leads to the individual willing to perform more, if you like, behaviours for that individual because they have more identification with them. So these two forms of respect give and serve two different psychological needs for an individual. And they are both associated with high levels of self-esteem well-being, so individual outcomes, but also can have important, if you like, organisational outcomes because they result in individuals preparing to do more citizenship for the organisation, work for, uh, on behalf of uh, the group that's showing them respect. Now, we know these two forms of respect are important because surveys of employees, when we ask them, how does your leader convey respect, we often get very similar responses. So we get answers like this. Uh, and the leader considers my needs. That's showing me respect. They acknowledge equality. They seek input on, from me on my decisions. They promote my development. But if you notice, these types of behaviours are very much associated with, if you like, a more recognition form of respect, or more about acceptance and inclusion and respect on the basis that everyone is due this. It's a generalised form of respect. However, they also talk about another set of behaviours, which is that and my leader respects me when he shows me or she shows me trust, when they give me responsibility, where they show appreciation for my performance, where they value my contribution. So these are two different sets of behaviours that employees value, the, the highlight, as being associated with respect, they don't distinguish what type of respect that they're talking about, but they are recognised them as both being very important. So, where does that leave us? Well, there are two different forms of respect in organisation, within lead, within leadership, in a leadership relationship. Um, employees often report not receiving respect from their leaders, what they believe they're due. Question is, some of the problems is, what type of respect are they talking about? 
And how can we, do, does it mean that we have to do different things in order to deal with the different problems of what type of behaviours they're talking about that are conveying either appraisal respect or recognition respect? Um, so one of the issues is that why they may not be aware of the impact they're having in terms of not showing respect is that they are in organisations where they have cultures that may not reinforce respect. Um, leadership and leader behaviours um, are very much shaped by the cues they pick up in organisations about what is important. Um, and many, and so organisational cultures that have, that promote diversity, for example, uh, promote equal treatment and equality, um, they give strong signals for leaders as to how to behave. Maybe a lack of awareness can be explained, particularly in cultures where those things are not as prevalent. But remember, I've also said that there is two things that employees want, recognition respect and appraisal respect. Now, when we come to the appraisal respect problem, this is where we start hitting problems for ourselves. Because whereas recognition respect is more generalist, everyone is, it's, it's for everyone in an organisation, you can set standards of behaviour. This is how you should behave, it's universal. Everyone is due this because they're human. When it comes to appraisal respect, how, do we, how does a leader determine whether they give appraisal respect to an employee? Because it's very much a subjective judgment as to the type of whether they think that individual has characteristics or they behave in certain ways that that particular leader values. And of course you can imagine this is going to be hugely varied um, across different organisations. There are no set standards often in organisations that really tell in, um, um, leaders how do you or when should you provide this type of appraisal respect. Um, there is another problem. This is, this is what's interesting because it seems that because leaders by virtue of their status um, often receive quite a lot of appraisal respect. You respect leaders because of their position, because of their status. It seems to be the case that leaders often might be less sensitive to recognising um, the need to convey appraisal respect, especially for em employees who, remember, are on lower status. So they seem to be less switched on to this because they're having both their needs, um, a need for inclusion from recognition respect from the organisation, but also the need for status already met. It's also one of the, I mean, it's interesting, it's also that it explains why individuals in organisations that often prefer, uh, perform jobs that might be thought of as menial or treated as menial, they're particularly sensitive to, to behaviours that convey disrespect because they rely far more on recognition form of respect that's due everyone rather than respect due to their worthiness or their status. So what can we do about that? There's two things to think about. The first of all is in organisations, often we don't distinguish between these two forms of respect. Both forms of respect are important for a healthy social identity and individuals require both forms of respect. One of the ways that we can respond to this problem is to develop respect climates recognition climates and there is lots there's quite a bit of research that shows that um, especially in healthcare where if you um, for example uh, develop team-based structures where people have more involvement in decision making that this leads to higher levels of people feeling that they have the recognition the humanity based form of uh, respect HR practices also play a role in helping for individuals to to feel that they, they're respected in the organisation and give strong cues for leaders to demonstrate uh, uh, recognition respect. And the, the sort of HR practices we're talking about are things like uh, developmental training. You know, the things that suggest that organisations care about the employees. Flexible working arrangements suggest, again, about some care and attentiveness. 
So these things can help develop an HR, a very an effective respect climate, but only for recognition form of respect. What do we do about this appraisal respect? Because essentially what seems to be the case is that leaders may not recognise the need to deliver the appraisal form of respect, which is essentially to ensure that individuals feel that they are worthy, that they are valued, that they are actually make a contribution, and in so doing, fulfills their need for status. How might we do that, given that this could quite vary across different leaders have different ideas. I respect you because you're a professor. I respect you because you're a very good artist. Or, you know, but that's quite personal. You may not respect me for being an artist. I'm not that tall of artist, anyway. Um, then there's the, um, so what might we do? One of the things we could do to try to, to deal with this problem is to ensure leaders, first of all, are aware that they need to convey both forms of respect. And one of the ways that we can make that perhaps a bit more widespread across the organisation is if leaders are clear about valuing the contribution individuals make, making that explicit about how they, the, the, the contribution they're making and the value they are uh, giving to the organisation. Um, set clear standards of performance in organisations so that when individuals surpass that, there is regular feedback on the contribution an individual is making, thereby reaffirming this appraisal form of respect. And the problem, of course, many of you will know, with you know, getting feedback on performance in organisations, often some, some organisations, that it's not done very well. Uh, often it's sort of someone might receive it at the one year annual performance review. Uh, we need to develop a much more effective system of giving people far more immediate type of performance feedback on a regular basis that exemplifies how their contribution is valued. And this seems to be, we say it a lot, but it simply doesn't happen in organisations. And it's absolutely critical if it's going to meet the need for an individual sense of status. And those both forms of respect are important in terms of, for example, engagement. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to talk about is move on, is that so far I've talked mainly about the employee's need for respect and why that's important. And what's interesting is in the leadership literature, there's very little about the concept of mutual respect. But in fact, in organisations, we hear it a lot. It's important that we have a climate of mutual respect in an organisation. Um, the leadership literature has hardly touched upon this. And it's important because many of you will know that there's been developments in our understanding of leadership that have moved away from the idea that leadership is simply about the formal role, the role that some formal managers may, may uh, perform leadership just because of their position. We understand leadership now far more as about the, the effects of leadership arise from the relationships that leaders have with followers. The traditional ideas of leadership have tended to ignore the role of followers. Followers are, you know, they're sheep. They don't have anything to say about the leadership. That leadership is, mu is mostly about the, what leaders do, how they behave. But new forms of leadership see it as arising far more out of the context of the leadership of a relationship that individuals have with followers. Now, the important thing about that is the quality of, in order for us to understand that, mutual respect becomes a much more prominent characteristic of understanding the quality of the relationship that an individual has with their uh, follower. The follower has respect for the leader. And from that, you then get stronger effects on performance, on job satisfaction and all sorts of things. The problem is most research doesn't, has not looked at it. Even if you look at one of the most common uh, uh, areas, which is leader member, leader member exchange, which argues that the relationship between a leader and follower 
characterized by high levels of respect, of um, loyalty, of uh, contribution. When even this research, when it looks at this, it tends to just assess the followers' perspective of whether the leader respects them. There's no attempt to look to see what is the, what is the mutual respect, i.e., does the follower respect the leader? And what happens when they both have high levels of respect for one another? There is a couple of studies that I've been involved in, and one of the things I've been interested in looking at is what predicts this high levels of mutual respect? How can we get high levels of mutual respect to leadership relationships if mutual respect is important uh, for leadership effects? One of the things that I'm also um, very, very conscious of is the, especially in my field, and anyone who works in management will know, there is a dreadful uh, propensity to complete, con constantly reinvent the wheel, to bring in uh, new, new fads and not tested. Um, this happens a great deal. Um, even we move on to the next fad before even trying to work out whether the other one's been successful. Um, if we want to see mutual trust within a leadership relationship, my thinking is let's look at some existing things we do use. Uh, that are used in leadership development quite a lot in organisations already. Do these have an impact on mutual respect? There's not been a lot of work done on what, the, you know, what characteristics bring about this mutual respect. This particular study I looked at was looking at uh, um, emotional intelligence. Uh, there are, and there's good practical reasons for it. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's quite a bit of research that shows emotional intelligence is associated with um, uh, high-level outcomes in terms of pro-social behaviour. Uh, we also thought that emotional intelligence of both leaders and followers should also predict a uh, mutual recognition form of respect. And the reason for that is um, emotional intelligence is negatively related to bullying in organisations. Um, it's highly related to perspective taking. So if you perspective, you can, if, you're, if, you, if you're much better at perspective taking, you can see the other person's point of view, you're more liable to convey an acceptance form of respect. Um, so we looked at emotional intelligence and we, all, we does that produce, does that predict mutual recognition respect? And then we looked at does mutual rec recognition respect predict job satisfaction and job uh, and, and effective commitment? The main thing to just report from this is, yeah, both do. Both the emotional intelligence of leader and both the emotional intelligence of the follower predict, together predict mutual respect. Mutual respect then predicts high levels of commitment by the follower of the employee, high levels of job satisfaction. What is interesting is that we also looked at what happens when you have mismatched. What happens if it's not mutual? What happens if you have one has high uh, uh, respect for one, but the other one doesn't respect the other? Under those circumstances, what we find, this is under those relationships, they have much weaker power to predict these outcomes. Where, these, where you have high levels of mutual recognition and respect, you have much higher levels of job satisfaction and much higher levels of effective commitment. This is another study, just quickly touching on. This one we looked at um, transformational leadership. Why? Transformational leadership is a long history in terms of use by organisations. Many of you, if you're unfamiliar with it, you know, basically says there are four you know, key types of sets of behaviours uh, that we might uh, expect from leaders which is idealised influence, you know, how they use charisma to influence followers, inspirational motivation, um, intellectual stimulation, these sorts of ideas. And what we said is, do these sorts of behaviours, if a leader expresses this, does this associate it with mutual recognition, uh, mutual appraisal respect? And then does this form of respect also predict mutual trust? Here we found, again, that transformational leadership produce, is associated with high levels of mutual appraisal respect between leaders and followers. More than that, many of you may think taken for granted that respect is important for trust. There's no research 
this is, that have shown, there's hardly any studies, well, in fact, I can't find one study that has shown, that has tested whether respect leads to trust. For this particular study, we tried to look at, does respect, mutual respect, result in mutual trust? We know that mutual trust is important in organisations, and the study does show it. We, why should, I mean, the interesting thing is, why should mutual respect predict mutual trust? Now, the, the, the answer to that is interesting in the sense that if you understand that trust, the, the, and what causes trust is generally uh, thought of as being about uh, character-based attributions. Um, often individuals will trust someone based upon their competence and their integrity. And so what we find is if you've got high levels of mutual respect between individuals, often um, that will denote um, high levels of mutual feelings of integrity and competence for one another. And so therefore it is likely to project uh, uh, mutual trust there. This question of mutuality um, is something that we haven't looked at in organisation research very much at all. For those of you who may work in health or, or, or social work or those areas, there's been more of an engagement with the concept of what does it, why is mutuality important? Uh, there's been l little theorising as to what's going on in, in, the, in leadership relationships as what happens when there are mutual um, ideas of respect or mutual ideas of trust. Um, what, we t what we find is that when you have mutual respect here, or mutual trust, this actually is a much stronger predictor of job performance, of job satisfaction, of effective commitment, than either trust in the uh, respect for the leader or respect for the employee. You get somehow a synergy, something is going on that when you get mutuality, the effects are far stronger on these outcomes. And one of the reasons seems to be, and people are thinking about it, in, uh, and I've given it some thought, is that the concept of mutuality, in addition to respect, is the idea that, think about it for yourself when you've got, if you've got relationships with others, maybe a lot of it has been looked at in terms of close interpersonal relationships, perhaps with partners, but what does it mean when you have that mutuality exists? There seems to be, it gives rise to a condition, a state, where people are open, much more emotionally expressive, and are open to far more psychological growth and feel safer. The concept of mutuality confers benefits that we haven't actually looked at in the, or in the leadership research at all. The other, reason, the other thing I want to say is Mutual respect also, interestingly enough, is being looked at in various other forms of uh, uh, workplaces, in particular in relation to uh, uh, what we call responsible leadership. What we're finding is that actually where there's high levels of mutual recognition respect, when an, or an individual feels high levels of recognition respect, they, they are, it's associated with a much more of a global identity and far more pro-environmental behaviours. So, you know, this is quite interesting that recognition forms of these forms of respect seem to be associated with other things that we are concerned with in today's organisations. Um, it's also the case that in order for there to be greater engagement around, for example, CSR, leaders need to operate across organisational boundaries. Many of you who may work in organisations where you work maybe uh, uh, in networks with other organisations will recognise the important role that leaders play in brokering across organisational boundaries because you need a group of organisations to work together in order to deal with a particular problem. No organisation has, has the answer. What we find there again, is that mutual respect seems to be re is an important has an important function in enabling those boundary, uh, 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 those um, uh, relationships to develop, to be productive, 
for, for getting support for a, uh, a particular, uh, achieving particular goals, for the exchange of knowledge, the exchange of information. So to recap before I uh, wind up, um, what do I want to say? Two, uh, a few things. First of all, respect is important in, organ in relationships, and particularly in rela leadership relationships. But there seems to be research that tell us that there's uh, increasingly employers report a lack of respect, particularly from their leaders. This is important because respect in leadership relationship leads to important outcomes, such as engage employee engagement. One of the suggestions is the reason why there seems to be increasing problems around respect is that leaders simply aren't aware of the impact they're having on employees. One of the reasons that might be is because leaders simply are not aware of the importance of different types of respect, different behaviours that convey different forms of respect, and in fact, may, because of their status as leaders, they may actually not be as sensitised to these things. But because both forms of respect meet two different psychological needs for a healthy social identity for us all, it's important that both forms of respect are given to employees. When we look at uh, organisations, there's a huge emphasis on recognition respect, how we treat one another in the right way, but there's far less, it seems to be, on the appraisal form of respect, uh, but this is important. Uh, there are a number of things we can try to do now in organisations to attempt to, to look at that. Uh, one of the ways is to remind uh, leaders to uh, demonstrate to uh, followers the contribution they are making, the value they are making, and that needs to be done on a much regular basis. And then finally, one of the things that we haven't looked at hardly in leadership research at all, but we're beginning to, is the importance of mutuality. The mutu what happens when respect is mutual between one another? Because many studies show that, in fact, there's often a huge imbalance in leadership relationships. That, in fact, it's what's called asymmetrical. That one person, there may be respect from one direction, but it may not be reciprocated. But when you do get mutual respect, the impact on various outcomes is quite significant. Therefore, we need to work towards how we try to provide, how to try to build mutual respect within relationships. Two ways might be trying to improve the emotional, emotional intelligence activities around leadership training and for employees, or for leaders providing uh, training around transformation, transformational leadership. And there exists quite good evidence for the impact of programs that result in those behaviours. <laughs>